This morning to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We'll be reading verses 5 through 14 this morning. I picked this sermon because I have preached a version of this at uh, over and over again throughout my pastoral career at um, at bedsides of dying saints to moving children to my own heart. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 5, is where I want you to turn to. And the reason I picked this, I guess, can be summed up in a, a lyric by one of my favorite bands, Mute Math. They have a song called Changes. And here's a part of a chorus I think we can all relate to, either right now or at some point in the uh, near past or near future. Uh, I'm just suffering from changes, paper cut from turning pages. Uh, there are a number of people here this morning, surprisingly, actually, uh, feeling paper cut. Although maybe there are some who are feeling even more than that. Maybe some of us have suffered some swift and powerful changes that it feels more like a broadsword through the middle than a paper cut. And they're wondering, where is Jesus in this? But those walking through the valley of the shadow of death aren't the only ones wondering that question today. Some in this room are experiencing less radical but no less real changes. Some are changing jobs. Some are changing schools. Some are starting school. Or they're thinking about what's going to happen after they graduate from school, which are both joyful changes but still changes that bring with them their own fear and their own anxiety. Uh, some of us are experiencing the ordinary normal, but somehow always perpetually shocking change of just getting older. Uh, kids get older, and they have to adjust to new responsibilities that come with their age, new, new burdens of knowledge, new joys as their world widens, but also new fears as their certainty about the black and whiteness of the world and the stability of the world changes. I think we would all do well to remember that even the youngest of us have changes that they're going through as they get older that bring with them worry and anxiety and fear that require just as much grace and kindness to them as we adults want for ourselves. Speaking of adults, the elderly or those who realize that they are on their way to being elderly, which is all of us, right? No one in here is elderly. We're all just on our way. Uh, all of the life changes and physical changes and health changes that come with being on your way to old age. But that's not limit uh, our thoughts of change just to the physical world, like getting older, changing jobs, changing addresses, all that kind of stuff. Let's also acknowledge that part of the paper cut of change is that we don't stay the same. We are not the same people we were a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago. We have changed, and sometimes those changes are for the better, and sometimes they are, they are not. And our families and friends have changed. Our church has changed over the last 10 years. And, and sometimes those changes have made relationships easier. And sometimes they've made relationships harder. And some of those changes have made it very easy for us to trust in Jesus. And some of those changes maybe haven't produced that fruit in us yet. We live in a world of change, of constant never-ending change. So in all of this change, where is Jesus? There are different answers we could give to that. I think one of the most common answers that we believe when we are in the middle of change, especially change that leaves us hurting or confused or worried, is to say, well, you know, Jesus isn't here. He's over there. And by that answer, we mean uh, that uh, either Jesus has moved away from us or we have moved away from Jesus. But regardless of who we think moved, we mean that the changes we are experiencing make us feel as though we have been separated from Christ. And that, by the way, is the answer that this church in our letter was giving to their life changes when the author of the Hebrews wrote to them. Uh, the author of the Hebrews was writing to Jewish Christians who had been experiencing a huge number of changes. So they had become followers of Jesus, which is a gigantic theological change, right? They now believed correctly that their Messiah had come. They now believed that the God who they had been worshiping when they were like nine months in the womb, who had entered into covenant with Abraham, had taken on true humanity, 
had died for them on a Roman cross for their sins and was now properly named Jesus. Right? That's a huge theological change. Some of you have had big theological changes in your life. You know how hard it is when your understanding of God and the way he acts in the world changes. And of course, by accepting Jesus as the Messiah and as God himself, these brothers and sisters were now experiencing a huge upheaval in their relationships. Uh, I want you to get this. Early Christians often worshipped in the synagogues unless they were forced out. So these relational changes were faced weekly, right? Every week, these Jewish Christians would worship next to their fathers and their mothers, their brothers and their sisters, their aunts and their uncles and their children, who, if they also did not trust in Jesus, would regard their faith as blasphemy and betrayal of their identity, ethnically, culturally, and familiarly. That is, in, in terms of the family sense, right? In other words, they faced relational distance, relational estrangement, relational change. Or if they were forced to leave the synagogue, if they were forced out, they would watch their family go off to worship while they would go somewhere else to worship. I mean, that's at least a paper cut of change, right? And on top of all that, these brothers and sisters were experiencing persecution. So this letter is written after Paul has died and entered glory. And at this point in history, the Roman authorities were now, perhaps helped by the synagogue rulers, who, by the way, could have been some of these saints, brothers and sisters, moms and dads. They were putting these Christians in prison. They were putting some of them to death, especially the leaders, which is why in our passage this morning, the author will tell us, will tell these saints to remember their leaders because those leaders were killed for Christ. So their lives are being lost. Their church is being thrown into disarray. Their relationships with beloved family members has changed. Their place of worship has probably changed, at least physically. It's definitely changed in terms of its cultural uh, fit and the way they felt uh, estranged and not at home. Uh, their understanding of God had changed in powerful ways from what they knew from when they were like one years old, right? So yeah, they were also asking, where is Jesus in all of this change? And the answer that they were giving was, well, he's not here or there, because maybe Jesus isn't who we thought he was. Maybe God isn't who we thought he was. And it's into that mess, the author of the Hebrews, who I'm going to call the pastor to the Hebrews, because this letter is very much like a sermon, and because he clearly knew them and loved them like a pastor. The pastor of the Hebrews tells these beloved saints that in all of these changes, Jesus, God, is where he's always been, right here, with you, in the middle of everything, always. Here at the end in chapter 13, as he's drawing this letter to a close with some final admonitions and exhortations, he sprinkles in these powerful sort of summary statements about Jesus, about things about Jesus he's been talking about throughout this letter, because this whole letter has been looking at Jesus. And here at the end, he wants them to keep looking at Jesus and to know that Jesus is unchangingly with you in an always changing world. With all the changes here this morning, I thought it would be good for us to look at Jesus in three deeply wonderful statements this pastor makes about him to this body. Uh, because like them, right, we have changes, we have some wounds, uh, and we need the rock of Christ. We need to know that he is here and that he is for us and that he is with us forever. And we're going to see that this morning by reading Hebrews 13, verses 5 to 14. And then we'll look at three statements from those verses. Uh, Jesus is with us as our helper. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is our unchangeable destination and anchor of our souls. Actually, number one, you could say, um, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's really what that should say. So let's read Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 to 14, pray, and then we'll reflect on this together. Let's hear God's word. Hebrews 13, starting in verse 5. Jesus tells us, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by food, which has not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear their reproach that he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Thus far the reading of God's own word. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we want to know your steadfast love and your unchangeable presence more powerfully in our hearts and in our lives in this world of change. But Lord, we know that, that we will not experience the peace that comes from having that steadfast anchor of the soul unless your spirit blesses your word to us. And so, Father, therefore, we pray that your spirit would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe your word this morning. Father, may the words of my mouth as your preacher, and may the meditation of all our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word, may it all now be pleasing in your sight. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first place we can see uh, Jesus in the midst of change is in verses 5 through 6, which tells us that Jesus Christ will never leave us or forsake us. Let's read those again, verses 5 and 6. He says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, so we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Uh, These brothers and sisters, because of persecution, because of broken relationships, they were in financial danger. So in the ancient world, Temples to idols were also where most business was done. It's where you would buy clothing and food and make contracts and business deals. Even if you had some kind of like, it wasn't really a banking system, but if you needed loans and stuff like that, you could go to those places to get loans. Jews normally did not participate in those particular markets, but they would set up their own centered around the synagogues, and they would trade goods and services among themselves and food and clothing and pots and pans and take care of each other financially. So when this pastor is telling them not to love money and to be content with what they have, he's speaking into that context. Having gone after Jesus, my position in society has changed. I no longer have access to the synagogue marketplaces, and I definitely don't have access to the pagan marketplaces, and I'm very vulnerable now, and I'm very afraid. But if I reverse that change, these uh, saints were thinking to themselves, if I leave Jesus, I could then have financial security, and I wouldn't be on the margins of both Jewish society and pagan society. And the word that the pastor here speaks to these saints who had that incredibly, I think, understandable fear and desire of not having what they need and thinking maybe I should leave Jesus, I want you to notice his response here is not harsh. And I just want to make this point as an aside. When we face changes, I think that we are afraid of meeting a harsh God who will be impatient or angry at our response to those changes, who will have limited patience and endurance for our fear and anxiety and sorrows and doubts. But beloved, Jesus is gentle. He doesn't get angry at the fear and the anxiety and the hurt and the pain and the doubt that was coming from these changes. God throughout this letter speaks this powerful, gentle word because he knows that it's gentle words that bring confidence in a shaking world. As Paul says in one of my absolute favorite verses, and I'm going to get the address wrong because I'm like the author of Hebrews. Somewhere God said, I don't really memorize chapters and verses very well, but in Romans, I think it's 3 verse 24, but it could be wrong. He says, it is the kindness of the Lord that leads to repentance. Not his anger, not his judgment, not his harshness, his kindness. And by the way, one piece of free parenting advice that we all need to take as I'm on my way out. If God's kindness leads to repentance, probably our anger isn't going to get them there, right? We want our kids to repent. 
We need to be kind, like Jesus is kind. That's an aside. What's this gentle word that God has for his people as they are experiencing doubt, anxiety, fear in this time of change? Well, the gentle word is the same word that God gave to Joshua in the Old Testament back when he was going through his own job change and his own relational changes. As Joshua was replacing Moses and becoming the leader of Israel, right? Becoming the man in charge of the crazy. (laughs) God said to him, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But what if I get sick? I will never leave you or forsake you. What if I what if I move? I will never leave you or forsake you. What if I have deep theological convictions shaken? I will never leave you or forsake you. God, what if I doubt you? I will never leave you or forsake you. What if I'm afraid? I will never leave you or forsake you. What if I wonder if Jesus is worth the pain and the price? I will never leave you or forsake you. You see, the point is that in all of these changes, beloved, Jesus is here. He will never leave us or forsake us. And by the way, when he says that he will never leave you, that means that he has never gone anywhere. He's not over there and neither are you. He is here with you. He is with you in the mountains and the valleys. He's with you before the change starts. He's with you when change is happening. He's with you when they stop. He's with you when new changes start. He's with you in the emotional mess and in the emotional repair. He will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus is with you. So in answer to the the question these saints were asking is, where is Jesus? The answer is he's right here. And he will always be here because he will never leave you or forsake you. Uh, Some of you younger saints out there, if you're experiencing hard change, you might justifiably wonder if that's true. Uh, Some of you older saints out there who have experienced that truth and who know that it is true, right? Who can look back on your decades of experience as you're on your way to getting older but aren't old yet, right? You can look back and be like, Jesus was there and Jesus was there and I didn't notice at the time, but he was there and he was there and he was there. You need to speak this word to the younger saints in this congregation so that all of us in the middle of change can believe deeply in our hearts, Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. He's always here. And by the way, Jesus will never do that because as we read in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That is such a powerful word and it's such just incredibly good news because the question you undoubtedly have or have had if you're going through a a time of change, particularly a very difficult time of change, is how can I know that Jesus will never leave me or forsake me? After all, like people get married, they vow till death to his parts, things change, the vow doesn't get fulfilled. People can be best friends forever until... One day they're not. And it doesn't always have to be because of sin, right? Sometimes it's just because you changed and they changed and your life went different directions. How do we know that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us? And the answer is because Jesus doesn't change. Jesus is not different from whom he has always been He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I know someone out there um, is probably going to be sassy, at least in their heads, and be like, well, Jesus did change because there was a time when he wasn't incarnate, but now he is, right? Yes, thank you. I didn't realize that. Neither did the author of Hebrews. No, I'm joking, right? No, of course, Jesus has changed in that he took to himself a true human nature, but the purpose of the doctrine of the Trinity, one of the purposes is that Person and nature are not the same thing. We believe in a God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when the second person of the Trinity took on true humanity, his person didn't change because he's God. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who both spoke everything into existence and walked around in the desert sands of Galilee, is the same person, the God who never changes, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the Hebrews pastor tells them throughout this letter, Jesus is that God of the Bible who made all things out of nothing by the word of his power. Right? Remember, this is something that is so important that you remember. The God of the Bible is not someone Jesus is like. Jesus is the God of the Bible. Jesus is the one who made all things out of nothing because he desired to. We might even say because he loved to, right? Creation is an act of our God's overflowing love. Jesus is the one who, as Job says, in his experience of change and upheaval and thinking about a world of change, Jesus is the one who unchangingly feeds the creatures of the fields and the forests and clothes the grasses and the flowers because he loves them. Jesus is the one who watches over the sparrows as they fly through the, the sky and through the hair of your heads as you go throughout your day. He's the one who causes the sun to rise and the rain to fall because he has always done so, because Jesus is always good, he's always kind, he's always loving, he's always compassionate, he's always gracious. He has never failed his creation because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? In fact, Jesus is so faithful to his creation that he chose to save us, not because we deserved it, not because we proved worthy, not because we were faithful enough, but because he loves us and has always loved us and he is always faithful to those he loves because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So their pastor in Hebrews will go on to talk about Jesus, right? How God became our high priest who died in our place so that his grace could triumph over judgment and so that we could so that he could rise from the dead and and be our priest who would never die again who will therefore always pray for us especially as we face temptation so that we can be sure that we will make it to our heavenly home and i think that's an incredibly powerful word right to think about the fact that jesus christ who is the same yesterday today and forever prays for us in temptation right jesus knows that we face change all the time, every day, and that with those changes come powerful temptations. Jesus is so faithful that he literally prays for us to overcome those temptations and to be forgiven when we fall to those temptations while we are in the middle of experiencing them, which means, beloved, Jesus is so close that he is with us even when we are being tempted, even when we are sinning. Jesus is with his people because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will never leave you or forsake you. And even when we fall to temptation, Jesus is with his people. And why is that? Because as this pastor tells these saints, because of Jesus' death, there's no longer any sacrifice necessary for sin because Jesus has died and paid for it once for all so that he could be in the midst of our sin with us. Not as our executioner, but as our redeemer who brings repentance and forgiveness and restoration as our shepherd who brings us out of the darkness in the light. And why would Jesus do this? Like, why would the holy God associate himself with our darkness and our sin? Because he is the same yesterday and today and forever. And he did that for Adam and Eve. He did it for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Joshua, and David, and Isaiah, and Peter, and Paul. That is just who Jesus is, beloved. He is the God who is with us, who will never leave us or forsake us ever. Which is why we know that he is the same for us today, right? The same creator who has always walked with his creation walks with us. 
The same sustainer sustains us. The same priest prays for us and forgives us. The same Jesus who walked with Israel in Egypt in the wilderness walks with us in gentleness and mercy and in love in our own valleys of the shadow of death, on our own mountaintops and on our own easy plains. You see, Jesus is who he has always been. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Beloved, in all your life's changes, know that Jesus is the same God who is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, who gives life to his sheep, who walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death, and who brings us safely to himself. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, he will never leave you or forsake you. And because that's true, final point, briefly, we have an unchangeable promise. It's verse 14. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. Uh, this word reminds us that this cannot be our final home because this place does not last. It's always changing. And it's not always changing for the better. Sometimes it does. God, is, God lives in the world. But there is a city which does not change because it lasts forever. And that city is the new Jerusalem, right? The new heavens and the new earth. It's the city where the unchanging God stands at its center as the sun. It's the city where resurrected men and women walk together with their God forever and need never fear that those relationships will crumble or fade or be separated by death ever again because they live in the eternal life of God's own life given to them through the Son by the Spirit. And that's our goal because that has been Jesus' goal from the beginning, which is to live with us in eternal unchanging peace, in eternal unchanging joy forever. I mean, what a wonderful hope, beloved. We know that this world will change. We will change. But where Jesus is bringing us is permanent, right? It's forever, and it's forever blessed so that we can confess with the Apostle Paul and 1 Thessalonians, we will always be with the Lord. I love that line. So what does all of this mean for us, my friends? Well, in light of the pastor's last word here, I think we can say a couple things. First, I think we can be free to admit that change is our experience. We don't need to pretend to be unchanging like God. We are changeable. Life is changeable. Change is expected. Change is even necessary right now. And change can be good and joyful. We should be free to admit that. Newborn babies, good and joyful. New marriages, good and joyful, right? But some changes can be small and obnoxious. Like when you start getting a little older and your knees don't recover after the jump shot like they used to, right? And some can be terribly hard and emotionally numbing, like grieving a loved one. Jesus knows all of that. We need to admit that as well, right? And another good word their pastor gave uh, was a reminder that Jesus experienced our life in all respects except for sin so that we can be confident that he knows how to help us because he empathizes with us. He gets it. He understands our emotional life. Jesus knows the heartache of death. Jesus knows the struggle of getting old. He knows the difficulty of sending children out into the world. Just a reminder again, uh, I have to ruin your Christmas thing before I go, even though it's not Christmas. The Apostle John was probably somewhere between 8 and 12 years old when Jesus sent him out into the world. God understands what it means to send a child out into the world. Jesus knows what it means to abound, and he knows what it means to be poor. He knows what it means to be extremely happy and dancing and to be extremely sad and weeping. Right? Jesus understands the changes of our life. He knows what it means to start school and to graduate, having been probably to the yeshiva, uh, which would have been the standard Jewish education system in Israel. He knows what it means to come home and to leave home, to be understood by your parents and to be misunderstood by your parents and your family, right? He willingly entered into those changes so that he can say to all of us, in all of that experience, in all of that change, 
I remain the same yesterday, today, and forever. I remain full of grace, truth, mercy, patience, love, kindness, and I will never leave you or forsake you as you experience change. In fact, I will walk with you and I will bring you to myself and we will live together with the saints forever in glory because I don't change. I am the steadfast anchor of your soul that you can root your life into as you experience the waves of change in the world. That's actually what he says. Well, the anchor of the soul part is Hebrews 6, 19. So let's be honest about our changes. Let's feel free to pour out our hearts to God when they're happy and hard. And let's encourage one another to answer the question that we all have in different changes. Where is Jesus? Which, with, with the answer, right here. Where he's always been and where he will always be because he wants to live with us. Because Jesus is our Savior, the anchor of our souls. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will never leave us or forsake us. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are always with us. Thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, please help us to know as we go through all different kinds of changes in our lives that we have in you a steadfast, immovable anchor of our souls so that in all times of transition, uh, we would not fear, but trust that you are with us, uh, working all things for our good, bringing us safely to yourself and to our eternal home with you in Zion. Uh, help us to encourage one another with these words and to know you more deeply in our hearts. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.